So welcome back to BARDA Industry Day. My name is Linda Lambert, and I am the Director of Medical Countermeasures Program Support Services within BARDA. We hope that you very much enjoyed this morning's sessions and you're ready for another round this afternoon. But first, we are very honored to have Dr. Paul Friedrichs here as our keynote speaker. Retired Major General Paul Friedrichs serves as the inaugural director of the White House Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response Policy. He also serves as the principal advisor on pandemic preparedness and response, and in these roles, he advises the President and coordinates U.S. government efforts to enhance our ability to prepare for and respond to pandem pandemics and other biological events. Before his current role, he was Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Global Health Security and Biodefense at the National Security Council. And earlier, he was Joint Staff Surgeon at the Pentagon. In that position, he coordinated all issues related to health services, provided medical advice to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. My mother's not here. <laughs> no have, nobody else cares. But I have, yeah. oh, they care, they care. <laughs> and two more lines, all right. Let me just tell you, um, he has extensive experience serving as the medical advisor to the Department of Defense COVID-19 Task Force. He is a, it is a true honor and a privilege to introduce to him to you and to welcome him. Thank you, and please join me in extending a warm welcome. Thank you. All right, well, uh, you're gonna figure out quickly that uh, part of my way of compensating for speaking right after lunch is I'm gonna wander around a little bit. Uh, so uh, I want to say thanks to all of you for coming back after lunch. Thanks to BARDA and to the colleagues who are putting on this meeting for the opportunity to be here. But let me say a more important thanks. You know, we have talked a lot about what went wrong in the COVID pandemic and we talked about how we should do this better or that better or something else better. But let's just wind the clock back for a second and acknowledge the four million people who didn't die because of the vaccines that were produced. Let's wind the clock back and talk about the, the real successes when we chose to collaborate, when we were truthful and transparent, and we had that ongoing dialogue about how do we offer as many Americans and people around the world safe and effective therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostics. This is not something that we've never done before. The National Defense Strategy describes some really ambitious goals and people challenge whether we'll ever be able to meet them. And my response is always, as long as Gus Pern is around, I know we will. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it is easy to focus on what went wrong and that would be unfortunate because part of why I wish I could have been here all day yesterday and today, is there is no response to a biological threat without you. There is no government-only solution to biological threats. There is no academia-only solution to biological threats. There certainly is no public health-only solution to biological threats. What we've learned over and over again is when we're successful, it's because we are collegial, collaborative, truthful, and transparent, and we work together, highlighting where there are constraints in the system and then finding solutions to them. And that, you know, someone told me, they said, wow, you've mastered all the bumper stickers that are out there. <laughs> but I think a lot of this is not rocket science. We make it hard in government, and I will freely acknowledge that we have mastered the art of complicating the simple and confusing the complex. Uh, so I will acknowledge that up front. But when we are truly in a moment, as we are right now, when we have an opportunity to step back and say, what does the future need to look like? The future needs to look a heck of a lot like what our parents told us when we were kids, which is tell the truth, be nice to people, and then figure out what the solution is that you're trying to get to. And so I'd like to lay out for you a little bit, I, you know, it's an incredible honor uh, to be the inaugural director of this office. Uh, this is 
Not what I had thought I was going to be doing when I retired after 37 years, I'll tell you that. Uh, part of that, and some of you have heard me say this before, my wife is also a physician and I had promised her for years if she would continue to put up with me and move around repeatedly that when I retired I would do exactly what she wanted. All the things I'd been promising uh, that, and deferring I would actually do. And I took this job and promptly broke that promise. Uh, and so we're in therapy now, counseling. Uh, <laughs> but I keep coming back to the point that this is a unique moment in time for us to either capture the best of what we learned from the pandemic and change how we approach biological threats or lament the fact that we didn't do that. And not that I'm you know, the only person who can do that, but when they called and asked, I couldn't say no. But I'll make my first ask of this meeting. I said yes to this because I passionately believe we're at an inflection point. I like to read history. If you read history of medicine, if you read history of public health, there was an important inflection point in the 1400s. We're going to go way back in the way back bus for just a second here. 1400s, that's when the medical school in Padua said, let's stop talking about black humors and yellow humors and black bile and all of that. Let's actually look at data. For the first time in centuries, people said, you know what, if three people have this and all of them then go on and do the next step, that's probably something we should take seriously. And from Padua in the 1400s, they rewrote the practice of medicine and laid the foundation for how we approach medicine and public health literally for the next 900 years. And if you look at the last century with the advent of antibiotics and the advent of a focus on understanding the world around us, physics, aerospace physics, nuclear energy, we began to understand how complex the world was around us and we began to actually leverage all of those tools to build new industries. One of the great outcomes of the tragedy of the 1918 pandemic was there were a handful of people who would not accept the wisdom at the time that that pandemic was caused by a bacteria. They said it can't possibly be true. And at great personal peril, in one case leading to suicide, researchers and people in industry continued to look for what really had caused that pandemic and that led to the field of virology. What we now accept as an important part of medicine and of what you all, many of you do every day came out of the 1918 pandemic and people being unwilling to accept that the death of millions of people was good enough. Unwilling to accept the best wisdom, the best knowledge of 1918, 1920, 1925 and they relentlessly continued to try and look for better explanations for what they had seen and better ways to mitigate what had happened so it didn't happen again. Not only did it lead to the field of virology, but by extension it reformed much of what we did in public health going forward. So the challenge, and where I'll ask again for your partnership, is can we leverage the pandemic that we just came out of and actually revolutionize how we're going to approach medical countermeasures in public health and integrate those activities more effectively? Congress bipartisan, interestingly, it still happens. Uh, Congress wrote the enabling legislation for this office specifically to get after this concept of how do we better integrate and synchronize what we're doing in the federal government and with you. If you look at the enabling legislation, it explicitly states that we will coordinate and synchronize efforts across the federal government. Now that is a Sisyphean task if I've ever heard one. Uh, I've got a boulder, every day we roll it up the hill, and then it rolls back down on my head, and then we do it again tomorrow. Uh, but there's great merit, and I hope you all will see if we're successful and if you will partner with us, that indeed it is possible to synchronize in the space that you're in across the DOD and the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Energy and all of the myriad of other acronym soups that are out there so that someday, hopefully in the near future, you could get the same answer from two people if you ask a question. Uh, it, you, you could get an answer from DOD that sounds a lot like the answer that you get from HHS, that sounds a lot like the answer that you get from the White House about what we're trying to accomplish and who's doing what. That's part of what this office was designed to do. 
but it also explicitly states that we will do it in partnership with you all. It directs by law that we will establish industry liaisons and partner with you all as we move forward to redesign how we synchronize and integrate these efforts. That's pretty cool because that now puts the teeth of law into this. It's not an opinion. It's not Paul Friedrich saying, yeah, I like you guys and I know some of you from past lives. It's actually a legal requirement that we must work with you going forward. So I'll reiterate the challenge that I hope you'll take away from all of this. We are directed by law to partner with you to figure out how to do this better. Are you willing to partner with us? Are you willing to give us the candid feedback? First, how do we stand this office up in a way that's effective and more efficient? I, I think it's a bridge too far to say that we could hope to be efficient right off the bat because uh, we, we're growing at a slow pace right now, uh, largely because there's no budget, hint, for our folks down the street. Uh, it would be great if there was a budget passed by Congress. We strongly applaud the congressional authority to pass budgets. We think that's a wonderful thing uh, to happen. Uh, and as we step through that then and we start looking at tasks that are ahead of us, we really go back and look at the National Biodefense Strategy uh, and we talk about three big groups of risks that we're trying to mitigate. One is in the deliberate space, and many of you are familiar with that. You're working on medical countermeasures for that, and I want to disappoint some of you by not talking about all the stuff that many other speakers have talked about. But what I will say in that deliberate space is as we look at the confluence of artificial intelligence and biotechnology, as we look at how rapidly those two fields are changing. We're kidding ourselves if we don't acknowledge that the bar is not dropping. The bar has dropped for those who want to misuse technology. So one area where we need your help in partnership, and if you've read the Artificial Intelligence Executive Order, if you've read the Biomanufacturing Executive Order, you'll see that there's some very explicit language in there that the President signed saying we will work with you in multiple offices to understand how we build guardrails. The exciting thing is the confluence of that technology, I think truly offers the next revolutionary change in the practice of medicine. If you look at the protein design work that's happening in Seattle, if you look at the work that's happening in Africa right now with vaccine manufacturing and environments where we never thought that was possible, we can fundamentally change how we protect people around the world in the next five to 10 years with these technologies if we can figure out the appropriate guardrails, no different than the aviation industry. You know, I, I joke, I come from the Air Force, so I jokingly say if you look back at the history of aviation, if you flew a plane and it crashed, that was called self-critiquing. Uh, and, you know, you built a bad plane. But then when you started carrying passengers, people cared a lot more about it. And as passenger planes crashed, we collectively said, that's bad. You kill yourself, that's a choice. You kill others, that's not a choice, that's bad. And then we came up with very clear and necessary agreed upon measures to ensure that airplanes were constructed appropriately, pilots were trained appropriately, the refuelers had the appropriate training to do that in a way that planes didn't crash anymore. When the nuclear industry came along, that started off with a bang. Horrible joke. Uh, uh, but as we worked on that, there was a tremendous partnership to develop that capability, and then there was an immediate recognition that we had to build guardrails around it so that it was used appropriately, and that led to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which has been incredibly effective at protecting Americans and setting the standards that are embraced around many, in many countries around the world to ensure that nuclear energy is used safely and appropriately. Now let's look at the biological century. Let's look at the space that we're talking about right now with this technology. Where are the guardrails? Where are the guardrails on gene synthesis? Where are the guardrails on who you sell what to? Where are the guardrails that describe here are the appropriate actions that responsible actors can take? Here are the things that any reasonable person would agree create unacceptable risk to the American public and to the general public. That's what we tried to lay out in the executive order that the President signed last week on artificial intelligence and in the preceding order on biomanufacturing. And again, I'll challenge you to partner with us on that. 
37 years in government, I can say with great certainty that we can write a lot of policy here. Sometimes we write good policy, and that's usually when we have true discussions back and forth with industry about here's what will work, here's what will not work. Here's where if you write it this way, it'll, it'll be useful for six months and then irrelevant and will impede American industry. These are the discussions that we need to have with you, not in two years, but over the next two months to understand how we help shape this environment going forward. So that's on the deliberate space. Then we talk about accidental biological threats. And for those of you who have labs, uh, hopefully this will not surprise you when I say that there's an explosion in the construction of BSL-3, B really BSL-2, 3, and 4 labs, not just in the United States, but around the world. The great news is people are recognizing as a result of the pandemic that they need that capacity and that capability. Hopefully, they're following best practices as they design those labs and put them together. But the one thing that they will struggle with is you cannot have a 20-year researcher in anything short of about 20 years. That experience just takes time. And if you stand up 100 labs around the world, there's not enough researchers with 20 years experience to provide the oversight and the mentoring and the training that prevents a young, eager, energetic, very well-intentioned researcher from committing human error, the most common cause of misadventures in a lab. That's an area where we're also gonna have to think how do we have better detection and medical countermeasures if that were to occur around the lab. And then the last one is in the naturally occurring space. You know, we've, we've done tremendous amounts on COVID vaccine. And again, I think, you know, there are many books still to be written about how all that came to pass, how that partnership really worked, how much effort went into protecting that partnership from all of the well-intentioned people who wanted to come in and redirect it as it was unfolding. Uh, but part of that lesson learned in that effort was not just what worked during the height of the COVID pandemic, but now we're in this really fascinating space in which if we had a vaccine with no side effects that would last you for the rest of your natural life, and if you kissed your spouse, you could share the protection with him or her, easily 15 to 20% of the American people wouldn't take it right now. That's stunning. That's stunning that we're at a point right now as a result of the last three years that we've lost the trust of the people that we're pledged to try and help protect. So as we talk about this partnership, it's not just a partnership between industry and academia and the government and how do we build better medical countermeasures. It's got to also be a partnership in which we talk about how we regain the trust of the American people and people around the world. How do we have a discussion about the fact that at the end of the day, when a mom makes a decision about what's right for her child, or a son makes a decision about what's right for their parent, an employer makes a decision about what's right for their workspace or their coworkers, they can do it with certainty that we have collaborated on safe and effective products, that we have been truthful and transparent with them about the pros and cons, so when they make that decision, it's an informed decision. The exciting thing about this, the revolution that we are watching happen in front of us right now, is we have a chance to shape it. And our office's charge is to be your partner in doing that, to integrate efforts across the federal government and with our international partners, domestic and global, with you all, so that five years from now, the question is not, should I get vaccinated? It's which one? The question is not, do I believe that it's safe. It's, of course it is. That's the opportunity that we face right now. Thank you for partnering. Thanks for all you've done. Look forward to working with you in the months and years ahead.